16. Salvation by love and hate. To speak of salvation by love and hate will be offensive to those who proclaim themselves the people of love, love children, friends of man, or any other term to set forth their belief in redemption by love. It is, however, necessary in all honesty to couple the terms love and hate. If we love truth, we will hate a lie. If we love righteousness, we will hate evil. If we love quote-unquote mankind, we will hate all those whom we believe to be enemies of mankind. Our humanism will make us militant and our hatred of orthodox Christianity. Precisely because of their intense dedication to love, the love people have been the most dedicated and passionate haters of the 1960s and 1970s. Moreover, hate in the thinking of the champions of love is not only a therapeutic catharsis, but also a mark of the redeemed. During the 1950s, it was a sign of election to the heaven of liberalism to hate Senator Joseph McCarthy. Since then, various other symbols of election have been affirmed, that is, hatred for Senator Barry Goldwater, for the war in Vietnam and the cause of South Vietnam, for South Africa, for President Richard M. Nixon, Governor George Wallace and so on. Similarly, conservatives have had their objects of hate, and each particular conservative group can sometimes be identified in terms of their enemies, the people they love to hate. There is nothing necessarily wrong with hate, nor anything necessarily right with love. Hate is wrong if we hate righteousness, and love is wrong if we love evil. However, the contrary is not necessarily true. It is not necessarily right to love righteousness, not necessarily right to hate evil, in that both can be a means of Phariseeism. Our Lord made this clear in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Quote, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Luke 18, 10 to 14 This parable is very commonly turned into a caricature by misinterpretations of the Pharisee and his prayer. As a result, Jewish scholars have been active in correcting the record and insisting on the importance and character of the Pharisees. Moreover, Christ's parable is very fair to the Pharisees. First, there is no hint that the Pharisee is lying. Christ presents him at face value. The man is a moral person who fasts religiously and tithes very conscientiously. He is a man of very high standards and dedicated faith. Second, there is no evidence that this Pharisee was merely doing these things simply out of a sense of necessity and duty. While all the details of Pharisaic legislation often became a burden and a yoke, Acts 15.10, Galatians 5.1, they were also seen as a privilege and a pleasure because of the moral stability and the freedom that they gave. Every good thing in life has its burdensome aspects as well as its joys. The ability to sing beautifully or to play the violin with mastery alike involve many hours of often wearisome practice as well as the pleasures of performance. Rabbi Klausner gives us a telling statement of the Jewish attitude towards all these Sabbath regulations of old and of Orthodox Judaism today. Quote, to be sure, whoever reads all the Sabbath laws in the Mishnah or Tosefta can easily come to the point of despair because of the multiplicity of restrictions in them. Yet it is well known that the Jews enjoyed the Sabbath and were not pained by it. Also today, there is no more common expression among the Jews even among the simplest of them, than their phrase, quote, enjoyment of the Sabbath, end quote. This is the case to such an extent that Ahad Ham, one of the most liberal-minded of Jews, 
yet with all his liberalism, a defender of historic Judaism, could express the following sentiment. To a greater extent than Israel has kept the Sabbath, has the Sabbath kept Israel? End quote. End quote. We can agree fully with this without touching the meaning of the parable. Sociologically, the Pharisee was right. Sociologically, he represented a far higher standard and was accurate in his self-portrayal. Sociologically, the Sabbath did keep Israel so that Israel's keeping of the Sabbath had more than religious significance. The point remains, however, that God was not pleased with either the Pharisee or with Israel's Sabbath-keeping, but his displeasure did not thereby condemn as such tithing, morality or Sabbath-keeping. Finkelstein's defence of the Pharisees is humanistic, and the subtitle of The Pharisees is, quote, the sociological background of their faith, end quote. The sociological importance of the law cannot be denied. It is of God's ordination. The primary reference of the law, however, is to God, and in God, then to man. Pharisaism saw the value of the law to man, and it made that paramount. Because the Pharisee in the parable saw himself and the publican sociologically and humanistically, he could see himself quite logically as superior and the publican as inferior. He was therefore grateful and content. The publican, however, saw himself in terms of the sovereign God and his requirements, and he therefore had a relationship to God that the Pharisee lacked. The publican came for grace and salvation, not for sociological justification, but theistic justification which he received. By turning to the 20th century scene, we can understand both Pharisaism gone to seed and the belief in salvation by love and hate more clearly. Sweden has carried further than any other country the socialisation of man after the manner of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, as Huntford demonstrates. It has taught its people to love the collective and to hate individualism. It has unified the people in their love for and contentment with Sweden by depicting the United States as the wicked, evil monster of the world. A ritual of hate and protest is thus regularly encouraged. Huntford states that Swedish conscience is, in fact, catharsis through ritual hate. It is akin to the, quote, two minutes of hate, end quote, of 1984. Indeed, during the Vietnam War, the popular Swedish dislike of President Johnson had something of the grotesque fury against Goldstein in Orwell's novel. Quote, I feel so emancipated, end quote, a Swedish housewife once said in a newspaper interview after a particularly violent demonstration before the American embassy in Stockholm. This is Phariseeism, which would have put the Pharisees to shame. It is, however, a logical development of the humanistic and sociological frame of reference. Something less than God is made the centre and the standard, in this case the Swedish socialist state. The enemy and sin are then defined, not in terms of God, but in terms of the new standard. Justification then comes in doing the will of the new God and hating the enemies of that God. The Swedish housewife, in taking part in the planned demonstration against the United States, was affirming her love of the Swedish socialistic state and her hatred of the United States. As a result, she felt emancipated, freed and clean. She had experienced briefly an emotional justification. In this, she was very little different from many people all over the world who find their justification in similar ritual hatred. Quote, Mental health, end quote, always improves in a popular war and suicide declines because people find a pseudo-salvation in love of country and in a hatred for the enemy. For socialists, a good man loves socialism and hates capitalism. For conservatives... A good man hates communism and loves capitalism. For the quote-unquote liberal, quote-unquote populist and champion of quote-unquote democracy, the good man loves, quote, the people, end quote, and hates all, quote, special interests, end quote. The, quote, good man, end quote, in all three definitions may be dishonest, sexually immoral and a liar, but he is on the right side and is therefore in the camp of the redeemed, 
despite his faults, whereas the hated enemy may be honest, chaste and a man of his word, but he is still a bad man, because the standard of love and hate so orders it. The Pharisees at least had a more moral judgment. Their standard, however, even were most faithful to Scripture in the outward sense, still used God's law for its humanistic and sociological value. The criterion present in both Pharisees and non-Pharisees was clearly stated by Caiaphas, the high priest, who brought the disputing factions to unity by bringing their ultimate standard into focus, quote, It is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not, John 11.50. At this point, the Pharisees and the Swedish housewife meet. Those who shouted to Pilate against Jesus, Crucify him! Crucify him! Luke 23, 21, may well have gone home feeling emancipated for their eloquent witness for the peace and freedom of Israel. Some champions of love will protest that we have not touched on their position, which calls for a more erotic and physical exercise of love. Brown believed that man must be regenerated, that is, he must become a child again. According to Freud, quote, Childhood remains man's indestructible goal, end quote. The child is the man of the future, quote, Wisdom directs us to childhood, not only to the immortal wishes of childhood for the substance of things hoped for, but also to the failure of childhood for the cause of our disease, end quote. Moreover, quote, Culture originates in the denial of life and the body, end quote, so that a return to life means a denial of culture and an affirmation of the body. The death of culture was predicted by Henry Miller, the death of the city, the nation-state, the machine and much else, and in its place the occult and the erotic will find full expression in man. Brown felt that, quote, utopian speculations such as those of Henry Miller must come back into fashion, end quote, if man is to solve his problems. Henry Miller, the champion of sexual love, is eloquent in his hatred. On the second page of Tropic of Cancer, he declared, quote, This then? This is not a book. This is a libel, slander, defamation of character. This is not a book in the ordinary sense of the word. No, this is a prolonged insult a gob of spit in the face of art, a kick in the pants to God, man, destiny, time, love, beauty, what you will. I'm going to sing for you a little off-key perhaps, but I will sing. I will sing while you croak. I will dance over your dirty corpse. End quote. Miller looks for the rebirth of man through a moral erotic love. He calls for the ruthless destruction of all the past, of religion, morality and culture, to make way for freed man. Like Walt Whitman, he looks for a world where man will be free to eat, drink, quote-unquote, love or copulate as placidly as the animals. Is this possible? Can man attain this state of undiluted love, whether interpreted sexually or not, and have the moral unconcern he desires? As long as man sees himself and his love as ultimate and determinative, so long will he also be consumed with hate, unremitting hate. The reason is a simple one. When man makes himself ultimate, he has no Sabbath. When man claims to be ultimate, he cannot disengage himself from the world and partake of Sabbath rest. His world is then his handiwork, supposedly, and it becomes his burden. However, when man bows before the sovereign God as ultimate, as Lord and Creator, man then can Sabbath. He can disengage himself from the world and from man, knowing that it does not depend on him. It is not man's love or hate, man's work or supervision, or man's planning and government, which ultimately govern and determine reality. Man has his place in the government of things under God, it is God's love and hate which are unceasing and also determinative. The humanist thus has an intensity to his love and hate. He cannot disengage himself and rest. 
everything depends on him. Moreover, because man as a false god can never dominate and control the world, he will therefore always divide it into two realms, one to love and one to hate, in order to have an enemy to blame for his failures. If Henry Miller's dream world were realised, mankind would be only the more unrestrained and savage in tearing at itself by designating a new segment as the enemy. A true Sabbath can only exist in a world created by the God of Scripture, for only then can man disengage himself from the world in the happy confidence that its government is absolutely secure. Where faith in the sovereignty of God and in his victory in time and in eternity is lacking or is defective, the Sabbath among Christians shrivels into a monastic withdrawal and retreat from the world. Among the ungodly, it disappears. Not surprisingly, Aldous Huxley, who saw the direction of humanistic civilization, proposed some years ago a new kind of Sabbath, the drug experience. The drug experience is closely tied to humanism, to, quote, a new faith, end quote, whose essential belief is that, quote, God is man, end quote. Charles Baudelaire, in his drug experience, felt, quote, I am God, thus. Under drugs, although the fears and the doubts can often run riot, the hope of the humanist to be his own god also finds expression. At the same time, the drug experience removes the man from the world he claims to be god over, and as a result, he finds it a substitute for the Sabbath, a disengagement from the world. A, quote, bad trip, end quote, means that instead of disengagement, conflict took possession of the man. The lack of a Sabbath haunts the humanist. Sometimes the results are ludicrous. Rousseau said of the place where he first met Madame de Rennes, Often have I moistened it with my tears and covered it with my kisses. Why cannot I enclose with gold the happy spot and render it the object of universal veneration? Whoever wishes to honour monuments of human salvation would only approach it on their knees. End quote. What had meaning for Rousseau was of necessity universal, because man is ultimate and is his own universal. Therefore, all men must venerate as a monument of human salvation a fact of purely personal and erotic significance to Rousseau. The Romantic movement was thus given to universalizing private lusts into cosmic facts. All the same, the Romantics, however much dedicated to, quote, Eternal love, end quote, were notable for the short duration of their loves. We are told of Liszt and Lolo Montes that, quote, In Dresden, she got Liszt, the great lover of the age, and so wore him out that one night he locked her in a hotel room and fled, leaving a substantial sum to pay for the furniture he knew she would break, end quote. Whether the reasons have been physical or emotional exhaustion, Human relations of all kinds have suffered at the hands of humanism in that no disengagement short of a break is possible where the Sabbath is lacking. The Sabbath disengagement prevents us from expecting too much of ourselves or others or of the world. The Sabbath, by requiring our disengagement, compels us to recognise that only God is sovereign and absolute and therefore to expect too great a hope from man and the world is to demand of them what they cannot give. Under God and within the framework of the Sabbath, we and others and the world around us can be rich in joy and fruition, but only as we see all these things under God. In the modern era, humanism has turned to one area of life after another, with messianic hopes therein, only to be disillusioned. One writer described his sexual activities with a woman he called El, in these terms, quote, With Elle, the battle was joined. She wanted normal sexual relations as something morally desirable as well as romantically wonderful, but she was incapable of being satisfied by the many men also who preceded me. Sexually, she liked toughs. She regarded, like many of her class and background, orgasm as the fruit of affectionate violence. She later developed overt masochism. 
she had wonderful intellectual conceptions of sexual apotheosis, the despair of her lovers. She was reduced to becoming the impotent pilgrim of the orgasm and an extraordinary example of socio-experimental retribution against, quote, over-spiritualization, end quote, end quote. To deny the Sabbath and the Lord of the Sabbath is to overvalue some aspect of human experience or person and to demand some kind of apotheosis of man's choosing. The denial or neglect of the Sabbath is the overvaluation of man and man's activities. It gives to man's love and hate an importance they do not merit, a decisiveness they cannot have and a burden they cannot carry. The Sabbath is a festival of the redeemed. On that day he can rejoice, not only in the happy results of what he does, 1 Corinthians 15.58, but also in the final determination of all things by the sovereign and omnipotent God, 